Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Are y'all ready to rejoice? Are you ready to rejoice? I'm so glad y'all showed up for second lesson of reasons to rejoice because I tell you, I just feel like this. God's going to share some awesome things with you today. I really do. Sometimes there's just scriptures in the Bible that confuse me. Anybody out there? It's like rejoice about that. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. So I'm hoping today that we can, we can kind of dig through it. I hope you get revelation today. And I hope that this week, today, when you go home, tonight, your prayer is just a little different. Just a little different. It's just a little bit bigger. It's just a little bit uh, more uh, expansive. It's just, just a little bit better toward accomplishing what God wants us to have, and that is joy. Because I'm going to tell you, you're not going to have a happy entire day. There is no way that you can go a complete day and be happy all that day. So if we wait to be happy, we're going to lose out on a lot of joy, aren't we? Are y'all ready to hear from the Word of God today? Let's pray. God, I thank you for your power. I thank you for your Word. I don't know what I would do without your word. I don't know what I would do without your blood. I don't know what I'd do without the privilege of prayer. I don't know what I would do without the Holy Ghost. I don't know what I would do without you, Lord, but I'm so thankful that I have it. And I pray, God, that you will reveal your word today and let it get deep in our spirit so that we can live it out in a day-to-day basis. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians 4 and 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. That means in everything, all the time. And he says, Then again I say, Rejoice. Now these people at this particular time had a lot of persecution to face. They were bringing the gospel into a whole new world. Um, They had established a church. And um, as I said in lesson one, they were dealing with a church division. There were people for and people against. And they were dealing with two women that had gotten crossways with one another. And they had let their division amongst themselves and conflict filter into the church. And Yodia had uh, a bunch on her side and Syntec had a bunch on her side. And they were at war. And so Apostle Paul was trying to get the pastor there to please help these two women get their act together because they were creating serious issues. And at one time he said they'd been great tools for building the church, but now they had become destroyers of the church. And he knew it wasn't really, they didn't mean to do that. They just kind of got crossways with someone. So in this very verse... The one before it is where he was dealing with the division issue. And then he says, rejoice. Well, I'm sure that the pastor of the church thought, rejoice. How in the world am I going to rejoice? I got two women, not two men, but I got two women that are are giving me fits. And how in the world am I going to fix this and rejoice? And then he says, again, I say rejoice. It is a commission. And you know what is beautiful to me? That I really believe that rejoicing is a Christian's coping strategy to battle for our joy. Sometimes it is when you rejoice, it doesn't necessarily mean you're joyful yet. But if you can find something to be thankful for, uh, this is the month of Thanksgiving, we can find something to rejoice about, rejoice about it. And then from the rejoicing comes the joy. It's like priming the pump for joy to flow. And then all of a sudden your spirit gets a little lifted and then all of a sudden faith starts to move and you can believe God to, to, to settle the division. And you can, uh, you know, you can get the strength you need to face whatever you're going through. Isaiah 61 and 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. And the first lesson was really about if there is nothing else to be joyful about, let us be joyful in His promises that He is with us, that He is right here present in my life. And whatever you face, He's going to be with you in the darkest of night. If you can't see Him, He's there. If you can't feel Him, He's there. If you don't hear his voice, I'm telling you, he is there. 
And God is with us even to the end of the world. Isn't that His promise? And that means even to the end of my world, He is with me. That's a promise. We rejoice about that. So always means in all things and all situations, and especially in the bad. If we only rejoice in the good, the good is just a freebie. You don't have to do any work to rejoice in good times. It's just like, oh, yes, hallelujah. Oh, you're going through bad times. Oh, let me cry with you a minute. Oh, let me get back to rejoicing. I've got some good stuff going on. If we, if we wait, because I'm going to tell you, those mountaintops, if you think and if you just factor the distance that you walk through a valley, and then you factor the distance that you have to struggle up to the top of the mountain, and then you factor in the joy that you get as you look, and man, that euphoria that you have looking at everything's going fine, everything is meeting, everything is all good, everything's in balance. How long does that really last anyway? Then all of a sudden you're going back down the mountain, you're in the valley. So we've got to learn if we're going to have genuine joy in our lives. I'm talking about the kind of peace and joy that he said was in the Holy Ghost. If we will maintain that level of joy, we've got to know how to get it even when we're walking through the darkest of times. So I believe that rejoicing over his promise was last, last week, and today we're going to rejoice because of his power. And um, really, I'll just let you know up front, sometimes the greatest prayer that you can pray is for God to strengthen you as you walk through what you're going through. Yes. Don't mean we don't ask for deliverance. Yeah, I've got my hand raised. I want deliverance. I want the answer answered. I want the question answered. But sometimes our greatest prayer is, Lord, give me the power to strengthen me for this trial. I marvel at the new Christians in Acts. The focus of their prayer can teach us a lot. They were being severely persecuted at the time uh, in Acts 4. And Peter and John had just been arrested and uh, humiliated, mistreated, been interrogated. And the people were in a frantic way. <clears throat> in fact, they rose up in such a, a furor that um, they finally just, the, the official just finally really chastised them and said, don't ever speak in his name again. And if you do, we're going to, you know, we're going to beat you and we're going to arrest you again. And, you know, gave them this ultimatum. And so the people decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go have a prayer meeting. And in Acts 4 and 24, and I marvel at this, not one time did they ask to be delivered from persecution. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't ask. Believe me, I've got my hand raised asking. But I just thought how, it's kind of, that's just amazing to me. You would think the most obvious prayer, the longest prayer, this is the way my prayers usually go, the longest part is the travailing. That God will answer this list that I have in here that Brother Tinsdale told me to make that I've been adding to that I bring with me to prayer meeting and I got it in my Bible and I got it memorized. That's the, that's the, the bulk, the lion's share of my prayer. And then at the end, you know, I try to, you know, then talk about, oh God, and in case you don't, you know, give me, give me strength or whatever. In this particular setting, I think it is so amazing to me It says, when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. And they said, O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. And they began to say, do you notice what they are doing uh, to to, uh, come against your message? And then what do you think they prayed for? Let's look at this, Acts 4, 29 through 31. And this is what they ask. Now, O Lord, hear their threats. Give us, your servants, great boldness to preach your word. Basically, strengthen us to do the right thing with boldness, without fear, to walk with integrity and to do it with boldness and to preach your word. In other words, in the face of the situation I'm going through, give me the boldness, the strength to basically withstand it with joy, with integrity, and with character. 
Then he says, then they say in 30, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Then they focus on, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. If I must walk through this situation, as long as you have your supernatural power at work in the earth, let it happen through me, then I'm okay with walking this road. I'm going to tell you, that's a hard prayer to pray. Verse 31 And you'd think they would finally get to saying, and Lord, please, turn this back on their head. Lock them up in the same cell that they locked Peter and James. I think I would have said it. I could get very creative with that. Then it says, verse 31, after this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, these people already had the Holy Ghost, so basically it would be they were filled with the power, renewed with power and strength. Then they preached the Word of God with boldness, and there were many signs and wonders that happened. I love to worship Jesus as my deliverer. I love it. Y'all start singing today. I'm going to start, oh, yeah, I rejoice, rejoice. Rejoice is my deliverer. Rejoice is my provider. I rejoice he's my way maker. He's my hero. He's my defender. He's on my side. He's not on yours. He's on my side. He's not on theirs. He's on my side. Okay, I love I love scriptures on deliverance. Even Jesus liked the deliverance idea. And I love that because sometimes when you're feeling guilty, you know, I, I just love that that Luke wrote this. I mean, I just love that. He prayed three times, three times in the garden, let this cup pass from me. That, I mean, I love that. Because that gives you and I, I mean, it's okay to pray to be delivered. I want to be healed. Don't you? It's all right to pray for healing. But sometimes my provision that I am really praying for is really his power to go through what I'm going through. He ends it with this prayer. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Often his divine provision is just the supernatural strength to bear the load because the scripture said, in fact, you can look this up in Luke 22, 41 through 44. It said, the angels came and ministered to him. And if he had to have angels strengthen him, in a dark time. How much more are angels circling around us when we are in trial? Not maybe to deliver us, but to strengthen us to keep walking. Sometimes you wonder how you keep your head up. You wonder how you keep your shoulders back. You wonder how you keep going. People will ask you, I don't know how you do it. Wonder how the Seguins are going through what they're going through today. And they have both said they literally feel the strength of the Lord. Uh, precious tells us that on numerous occasions she's seen angels in her room. You know why we walk through what we do? We'd love for God to just kind of, you know, take it away or maybe prevent it from ever happening. Or, you know, God has his ways and I don't understand all his ways. But what he promised, if we will ask, he will strengthen us. The angels ministered to him to strengthen him for the prayer. And then the Bible says he prayed more fervently as it was great drops of blood and said, Nevertheless, I will walk this road. And he did. So sometimes we have to have just that strength and power. This is me. God, just in case you might think I'm enjoying this trial, let me act really pitiful and tell you how it ought to be. That, that's, my, that's my favorite posture. I'm telling you, I can get into it right now. I I, I can get into it really quickly. All I need to think about is some of the deficits in my life and some of the situations that need to be fixed. And I I can get into that, you know, God. And I can give him all. I can even quote scriptures from the Old Testament to the New on how it is the right thing to do. And I just don't want to really want to rejoice too much on and act too happy about my trial I'm going through. Because I don't want God to get the wrong idea. 
Exodus 14. I'm not sure what God wanted from the Israelites after the Red Sea miracle, but they danced and they rejoiced. But they, you know, we, we talk about how they murmured and complained against God. And, and you know, God said, you, you've tested me these 10 times. And, you know, since you won't go into Canaan, you, you know, I, you know, you're going to march in 40 years. And we really feel like we have superior faith in that. I mean, I do. I think I do. But the reality was, what if that were you walking three days? The scripture says they walked three days. We're talking about children, elders, uh, whatever their possession. Three days they walked with no water. That's hard to handle. They've just been delivered. God just showed his mighty hand. And I'm telling you, that has happened so many times in my life. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is with you. Yet it seems in certain areas, things just aren't measuring up. God, this is crisis here. I am over the cliff hanging. And they finally find water. You ever been there? Thank God the answer's come. Thank God. You know, the check's in the mail. And you realize it was the check that you write to the credit card company that want you to borrow money. You could fill in the check, anything you want. Of course, you're going to be paying 45% interest. Then they got to the water, and the Bible said it was bitter. It was unfit to drink. They couldn't even drink the water. And that's when they began to say, what in the world's going on? We're here we are. We left, and we're going to die. And they complained. The Bible says they complained to Moses, what are we going to drink? That don't seem very bad to me. I'm thinking I've done that before. All right? But later, God would say to Moses, I've test, they've tested me these ten times. And this was number one, by the way, because God was counting. And really what he had a problem with, he had a problem with their attitude. They'd just been through the Red Sea. And yeah, it was tough. But he was just trying to train their hearts on how to walk through to be victorious conquerors of a land that they were going to possess. I don't know why God just didn't take, a, take helicopters in there and just rescue them out. And, I mean, he's got a lot of that stuff up there. I just think he does. I just think he does. Because remember one time you got Philip, he's at the revival, and then, then he needs to be preaching to the eunuch. And, you know, God just helicoptered him out and just plopped him over there, and he's preaching to the eunuch. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff up there. I don't know why he didn't just helicopter him out and just said, okay, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. Just drops them, you know, drops them into the land. And then they just walk in there. You know why he couldn't? I want you to think about that. It's the same reason why God allows us to go through things. Character building. They would have been in a land that they had no clue how to even manage. Didn't know how in the world to do whatever they were supposed to do. It would have been wasted. It would have been. But what God did is he took them through a training course to strengthen them, to show them how to basically grow up and be mature people. David said it like this. He said, I have, I have quieted myself as a weaned child. <clears throat> basically, I select what I'm going to let come out of my mouth when I am in a crisis. That's basically what he's saying. God basically wanted them to show that resilience to say, wait a minute, God brought us out of the Red Sea. God's going to do something. He's going to do a miracle here. Instead, God had to say to Moses, all right, take a stick, throw it in the water. It'll make it clean. And this angered God. I have to say, I think I've angered him from time to time. It is hard to say rah, rah, rah when we pray and try to do our best and life still gives us a bitter pill to swallow. I, I'm just telling you it is. Jesus taught us that some things are difficult. Jesus taught us some things that are difficult to wrap my mind around and they're just not appealing. In Matthew 5 and verse 10, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. I thought there are scriptures that were about if you do right, you're going to be the head and not the tail. I am the world's worst of picking out the scriptures that I really like the best. 
And what happens is we often don't mean to, but then when we go through a dark trial or something doesn't pan out like we spoke it, or maybe that prophecy hasn't come to pass like Abraham, God said, you're going to have a son, and then he's past childbearing age, and, and you know, he's still, still walking, still having faith. I mean, I, I don't know how he did it. He did mess up a few times, though. <clears throat> Helps my feelings today. <clears throat> but... <clears throat> God blesses those who were persecuted for doing right. The, the Jews crucified Jesus because they only took the scriptures that appealed to them. They said, but he's going to be a king. But he's going to rule over and we're going to be in, in ruler over Jerusalem and we're going to be over the nations. What they did is they took scriptures that are talking about the millennium that is yet to come. It's going to come. But they crucified the very Messiah because they didn't want to look at scriptures that, you know, it's like, no, I don't want to see that one about him riding on a donkey. No, I don't want to see about he's going to be crucified. I don't want to see that because I want to believe that he is going to just come and he's going to rule and reign and we're going to be big shots. They crucified him because of that. Now, verse 11 says, God blesses you. When people mock you and persecute and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you're my followers, then verse 12 says, Be happy about it. Be very glad. <coughs> what? I, you know what? My register, it just don't register. Then he gives a reason that helps. He says, For I can rejoice today because I'm going through that because great rewards await you in heaven. Then he says, and remember, ancient prophets were persecuted. Well, wait a minute. I, I just want to talk about David slew the giant. You know, man, he looked like the big dog in front of everybody, and he goes up, and this little squirty guy, you know, goes up, and, and he has to get help to pull off his helmet, you know, because it's so heavy. And then he takes his sword, which I'd have loved to have seen. Well, no, that's kind of bloody, but anyway, it was just cool. He has this big sword because he's a big giant, and David probably can't hardly even pick it up, and he cuts off his head, and he runs through the streets with his head in his hand, and... You know, I mean, that is pretty gross. It's pretty gross. But it's still pretty cool when all these people run away and all the enemies run away and, and all the people that were taunting them now disappear. I mean, that's just pretty cool. But then not always is it that way. Jesus writes similar words. Uh, James 1, 2 through 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I don't think so. I don't think so. For you know when your faith is tested. There is something that has to get into our hearts deep and deep and strong and filtered into every fiber of our being. You can't wait till the trial comes or the situation comes to decide, I'm going to be strong in this. We have to decide today. We're going to pre-think what we're going to do because in that trial, it says, for then you know when your faith is tested. What that means is, I don't care what you're going through today and what prayer hasn't been answered or what prophecy hasn't answered or what dream hasn't come to pass that you feel God's given you. I don't care what has not been completed today. You can rejoice because you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Then it says, verse 4, so let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed you will then as a Christian as a man or woman of God be perfect and complete needing nothing you may not have a lot of money or you may not have a lot of whatever out there but what God is saying is when I look down I look at a perfect and a doesn't mean you never mess up what it means is your faith is perfected when we are able to withstand whatever and still rejoice and say there is great joy because God's going to reward this. Yes. My husband uh, went to preach for uh, Brother Kevin Cox many years ago when he was pastor in Bogalusa with his father. So that's been a long time ago. But there was a lady there. Uh, we were in the office uh, before service and I had left to go and get a seat. And there was a lady that, that came in and uh, Brother Cox received a call on the phone they had kind of prearranged this from what I understand. And uh, he let them tell her, or I, I know, they, he had the news, brought her in the office, and he told her that 
her son had drowned. He was about 18 or 19 years old. And they said she had prayed for the son and prayed for the son and really had faith that he was going to be saved, his son. You don't have time to decide what you're going to do. My husband said he'll never forget this as long as he lives. It has been something in front of his mind. She fell to her knees and raised her hands and began to bless the Lord, and she began to worship, and she says, I don't understand. I don't understand why. I don't understand, but God, you are, you are, you are God. I worship you. I praise you. And she worshiped and cried and worshiped and cried. She began to speak with tongues, and they said she got up finally. She said, all right, let's go have church. Romans 5, 3 through 4. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Why? For we know that they help us develop endurance. I'm going to tell you, it is really a bad thing in this world. Brother Mike has gone through, through a lot of the repercussions from this. It's a very bad thing when people spoil their kids, give them everything they want. Yeah. Yeah. Then they just decide that everybody's got to do whatever they think they need to do. And the next thing you know, they think that what's yours can be theirs. They just take it. And, and if, they, if they don't like you, then they can just get rid of you. It's a terrible thing to see that. Well, I'm going to tell you, if we really want to be mature Christians with integrity, it will be because God has allowed us that testing ground to develop that and that we can then truly say when we're on the other side that, he is great, and you know that God has done His will in our life. Okay, for the consistent theme here is trials strengthen us, trials teach us. Enduring trial with grace and integrity is the sign of mature faith, pushes us up the scale. Uh, let's see, it says, We rejoice too when we run into troubles and trials, for they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confidence. Hope of salvation. I'm going to tell you what, there's just times when I'm feeling a certain, there's just a certain pain that you feel that you really do long for heaven. There are times, I'm telling you, I, I woke up, I don't know which day it was, but I had so much arthritis in my hand, I think it's from, I'm serious. I had so much arthritis in my hand and my knee was froze up and I'm going, oh my goodness, I've got that bad word, that old people word. And, and I was kind of hopping around. I'm going to tell you, the older you get, the better heaven seems. You know, the more struggle you have in your life, the more it makes you long for heaven. The more chaos we have, the more we long for true peace. The more struggles that we go through, I'm telling you, we want to get to the other side. And sometimes that may be what gets us there. Because I'm telling you, I do some serious praying when I'm in crisis. In fact, I wonder if the Lord recognizes me from the person that when I'm not in crisis... I wonder if he does. He's like, my goodness, she can do some travail in prayer. My goodness, she can do some intercessory prayer. When you're going through a struggle and you know only God can do it, you can't do anything. Let me tell you, you get serious. And who knows, that may be the very thing when we get over there that we look back and say, well, you know, God says, well, you know, if I hadn't, I look where you'd have been. Door number two. Simply put, the writer is encouraging us to discipline our hearts, our minds, and our mouths to grasp a deeper concept. Struggles bring spiritual maturity. It brings richness in character. It causes us to be resilient. It means that you're not, uh, things don't bother you as much as they used to. I'm telling you, I used to melt down if someone didn't like me. I still don't like it, and it still kind of bothers me, and I still try to send flowers or do whatever, you know, to make them happy and all that. But used to, I'm telling you, it just, I remember someone before I, I was, uh, before uh, uh, 10 o'clock service in the building over there, I was going by and I'm, you know, my happy self and I'm shaking hands and this person, and I had to get up and lead worship. This person took that opportunity to tell me why she had been offended at me and she had this list of stuff that I had no clue what, I, I'm just... You know, you did this and slighted and my daughter and, and she just, I'm just, I'm going, oh, I'm sorry. Man, I'm, 
I'm, I'm sorry. I had to leave there. It's time to start worshiping. Get up there and lead worship. And I'm telling you, that was the hardest thing I ever did. And I know the church wondered why the whole time I'm saying, rejoice, people. Tears are running down my face because it literally almost died. Well, you know what? I hate to say it. I don't mean to be hard and callous, but if you don't like me or you're offended at me, <clears throat> come and you know, let's talk about it. But really, it's not going to ruin my week. I'll try to, try to fix it, but, but my God, you know, people, I make mistakes. You make mistakes. Let's give each other a wide berth of mercy here. You know, you know what happens when you, when you can't, you know, resolve your issues? Apostle Paul said you show that your children, you need a bottle and diapers that you need to grow up so you can really act like mature Christians because he said when you act like that and you can't resolve your issues and really be happy here, you know, with a group, you know, pl get, play together on the playground. And, you know, if you can't, he said you're acting like mere men. People act like that out there. But you go through enough trial and tribulation in here, I'm going to tell you, it'll wash out all that junk. You know, if you're so worried about your feelings, and I, I don't even know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody. If you're worried about your feelings, you know, the truth of it is you can't worry about the kingdom and be worried about your feelings. You can't be worried about somebody else's issues and be continually worried about your own. So you know what? I've got a good remedy that's from the Scripture. Just get worried about His kingdom and get worried about other people's issues and get worried about helping the kingdom go further and you will forget about all your offenses. Can I get a witness? And no, I'm not talking about any of y'all. Uh, let's see. Pray for deliverance. Here I am at 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Dear friends, don't be surprised at fire trials you're going through as if something strange is happening to you. Oh my God, how could this happen to me? You know, I am on the front seat and I worship every Sunday and I'm at, uh, you know, war on the floor and, you know, I'm just good. I'm just your pet child, right? Verse 13, instead be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in suffering. Revelations uh, 1 through one, 1 and 9, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in the, God's kingdom and in patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. Basically, I don't know when it's going to happen. But if you can endure and you can rejoice through trial and tribulation, do you know that when you go through hardness and you continue to be faithful. You go through hardness and you say, I don't understand but I'm going to continue to walk in faith. I'm going to continue to speak my, your promises. I'm going to continue to believe that you're the greatest thing in this world. I, I'm going to continue to keep marching. No one's going to know the difference when I'm going through a trial or when I'm on top of the mountain. I'm going to keep walking because I am, I am sure that God is able to do whatever He wants to do and whatever He hasn't done yet, He's able to do. And it must that's not be what he wants to do yet. And I basically give God control of whatever's going on in my life. Let me tell you where you're going to end up. It says rejoice. Because those type Christians one day are going to find themselves surrounded by a host of witnesses. And you will look around. And you will see next to you. It says, John, your partner's with me. And you look beside you and you see John. And Jesus even said, your partner's with Jesus. And you look and say, wait a minute. You mean, how in the world did I get to the front of the line? How in the world did I get with this crowd of people? There are millions and millions of people out there and there's this select crowd. There's an elite crowd that, that's kind of crowded around the front and, and they have special crowns and, and they, they, they really, you know, I mean, these people are in the know. You know, they're, they've got the red room. They've got the red room at the airport. I mean, they really, they've got the, you know, the really $10,000 seats on the airplane. I mean, who are these elite people? I see Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob and I see, and then the Lord looks at you and says, you are here because you walked the same way they walked in trial and tribulation. I watched as you walked through that trial. I watched as you came to those bitter waters and you didn't complain and gripe and throw up your hands and say, I want to go back home. You know what you did? You said, well, I don't know how, but I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it one more day. I'm going to make it one more mile. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep worshiping. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep quoting the word. I'm going to keep using his promises. 
I'm going to keep praying the same prayers. I'm not going to give up. And he says, and one day, rejoice today. Because if you endure with joy, with faith, he says, you are going to be in that group, that elite group. Find yourself among the patriarchs. Listen to this. So, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 8. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little time. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on that day when Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have not seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with glorious, inexpressible joy today. Not because of what he's given you. Not because of the prayer he's answered for you. But because you know that whatever you go through, you're going to be counted among those that have endured. Another encouraging note. Today in 2013 is as you rejoice, don't stop praying. Romans 12 and 12 says rejoice in confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep praying. Do keep praying. But remember this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. God is with me. When I'm moaning and travailing about things that need answers, I'm going to tell you a scripture God gave me and I'm going to end with this today. I was whining about my little list and... You know, giving God directions on how to facilitate this list. You know, the time frames and the way to go about it. By the way, Sister Kleinitz did a great job uh, Wednesday night, and she told us to be praying for the double portion, that there's a lot of, of ministers that feel that 2014 is going to be that year. So I want you to pray that. But, I mean, I'm going and telling God all this stuff. And really what the Lord told me to do is in Psalms 59 and 10, it says, My God of mercy shall come to meet me. You know what he told me to do? He said, you do the best you can to be the best person you can and discipline your life to try to help fix and do the best you can to be solutions. I mean, don't just excuse it all on faith. Do the best to manage your money. Do the best to manage your health. No, don't just say, well, I'm going to eat, I'm going to weigh 500 pounds and God's going to, you know, God's going to help me, you know, trim down. But I'm going to keep eating everything. But I just believe the Lord's such a miracle worker that I'm going to weigh about 120. I mean, really, that don't make sense. And he says, if you will, do everything you can. And as you're working toward being what you, the part you can do. You keep working and you keep rejoicing in His ability to do it. And rejoice in the fact that God is trusting you to endure for a season because He is testing your faith to see how strong it is. He's not testing it for Himself. He's doing it for me. He knows, he knows already if I'm going to make it or not. And I tell you what, He knows I'm going to make it. I made up my mind I'm going to make it. But when you go through, he said, you know what you're going to find? One day, he's going to come walking down that dusty road. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to meet you there somewhere along the way. You know what? Last time, Donna, you were able to endure five miles. Now, some of you runners and walkers, God bless you. You know, you made it that five miles. But you know what he says? I decided on this trial, you're going to have to run another two or three miles. You, but God, I can't. But my legs are hurting. But I'm out of breath. I'm out of life. I'm, I'm fixing to die. I'm fixing to pass out right here. And the Lord said, no, you're not. You won't. You won't. I trust you. You can make it. You can make it. And so I do a jig. And I rejoice today because God is trusting me to, to maybe just run a few more miles. Because he knows that there's something greater because he's going to meet me. I'm telling you, he promised. He said, I'm going to meet you. Uh, Psalms 59 and 10 says, in his unfailing love, my God will stand with me. And he will let me look down in triumph on all my enemies. One day, what you are looking for. For what you may be feeling today, like you're in a dungeon, you may feel that, you know, you're trying to 
get those ends to meet or trying to resolve things in your family or trying to do something with those aggravating kids. And I don't know, you know, you just feel like it's on top of you. One day he promises that I am going to stand on top and I am going to look down because I'm going to be on top of whatever's bothered me. And when I am on that day, I'm going to look back and say, thank you, God, for really stretching that trial out. Because you know what? I made it. I feel stronger because of that. Would you stand right now? Today, I rejoice because of his word. Today, I rejoice, Sister Margie, because of his promise Today, I rejoice because of his power, of what he's able to do. And today, I rejoice because of his strength. Now, if he hasn't accomplished whatever you want him to accomplish in your life, I charge you today. Let this be a week of rejoicing. I want you to rejoice for those things that we've named. If not one thing goes right in your life. Now, of course, you're going to have some things to be thankful for. Rejoice about those. But if you can't find anything else to be thankful for, I want you to rejoice because he is our God and he is with us. And if angels ministered and strengthened strengthened him in the garden, I will prophesy to you 100% assurity today where you walk, Sister Martin. Angels are holding your arms up this week, today. There are angels around me. They're strengthening me. You're not in this alone. You're not walking this alone, Brother Gary. You're not walking this alone. Don't be afraid of of the future because let me tell you, it's good. It's good. It's good. Well, how are we going to get there? We're going to go through the bad, good, the bad, and the ugly. We're going to go through whatever because we're going to get there because his promise is mine. And let me tell you, if you need to be strengthened for your journey today, just ask him. Just ask him, Lord, strengthen me until you deliver me. Let's lift our hands and ask him for that right now. Lord, I thank you for the word today. I thank you for the spirit that is so present today. Lord, I felt your spirit last night when I went to bed, and I felt your spirit when I woke up this morning. And Lord, I thank you that when you unfold the rose, it's, it's just at the right time. And God, I pray for patience to come upon us. And, and I pray for that, that spirit of, of waiting with rejoicing to come upon us. Let us learn how to rejoice in the process. And I pray in Jesus' name, on that final day, I pray that we will rejoice with the patriarchs of old. And, and we will realize that in every situation, Situation. We can see your fingerprints, we see your footprints, and we see your handprints, and we see your kisses of love all over every trial that we've ever been through. In Jesus' name, we trust you today. Amen. I just want you to say, I trust you, Lord. So I will rejoice. God bless you.